Greetings and salutations, so you folks out there. I've got another normal run of the mill cast, and I say that because I am not doing all the post editing and all that. I really do not have the time to with uh, what remains of this day, so I'm just going to cast this, post it up for everybody to enjoy, and hopefully it will tide you over until Tuesday when hopefully I can resume my normal casting schedule. I know uh, some of you knew that I have had an absolutely crazy week. And hopefully all of the drama is dealt with and I will be free to pursue my own interests in the coming week instead of having to deal with all of the other crap that's been heaped up into, uh, heaped onto my plate. Alright, this game is going to be on the Seraphim Glaciers and it is a 2 versus 2 versus 2 versus 2. <laughs> um, the map is divided into four islands basically with some expansions in between them and a center island to go for. This is a rather popular map. It's played in one versus one quite a bit and uh, it, it does uh, it does make for some interesting gameplay in a two versus two. I'm not a huge fan of it. I'm stumbling over my words here. I don't know why. Um, because I tend to get a little, I, I don't know. I tend to get a little overwhelmed, I guess. I, d I don't know how to react to full Navy maps. It's not really my forte, but they are fun to watch just because of all the different avenues of attack that are open to you. You can do drops. You can do Navy. You can do hover. You can do all air. You can do a variety of things that will work on a map like this. And there are some reclaim patches available to you. Even though it is a stark white uh, map, all of these rocks can be reclaimed, these little ice shells and all of that kind of stuff. So it's something to be wary of and to keep in mind. Let's go ahead and introduce the teams, then we will jump directly into the gameplay. On the bottom right, we have uh, X, XOX. I'm going to call him Kiro. As UEF paired with Saruman, Darth Saruman. That is an epic name. As Cybern, so that's a UEF Cybern team on the bottom left here. We have, I'm going to call him Dude. <laughs> there are some strange names in this one. I should have looked at these before I even started. And Cod, that is going to be Siren and Aeon. On the northern left side team, we have Super Zero and Elwood. And I'm not sure whether this guy is going to be a Zero or Super. His name is kind of contradictory, but I suppose we shall stick it out and see what comes of it. That is going to be an Aeon and UEF team. And then in the top right, last but certainly not least, we have Zunin and Slevenke. Slevenki. Make that sound Russian. I don't know if that... Uh, that is probably not what he meant by that, but I'm going to have fun with that. And that is going to be an Aeon and Cybern team. That is going to wrap up that. Let's go ahead and bump up the speed a little bit and see what is going to take place. I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye that confused me for just a second, but there actually wasn't anything happening. So we've got a little bit of a variety of things going on here. We've got engineer-only expansion in the bottom. We have Aurora is headed over to the center island. We have an artillery accompanying an engineer over here, a lone engineer and a scout winging out to the south for the right side island and then a drop on the north. So that's pretty much every possible mode of expansion that you can have. You do have some bombers coming into cover on the southern, well the left side. I, I'm not sure how to, map divided into quarters is not very conducive to describing your location in a cast. I suppose I shall just have to deal with it. This bomber is going to eliminate the engineer just before that factory is finished and then drop again on that Zooey. So problem solved on that expansion. We got a lonely red engineer up here. Not sure where he's headed off to, but we will find out. Probably over to the island, but he's going to be a bit late to that party. Got a point defense going down for Kiro. And that point defense is not going to be enough in range of the factories to prevent artillery from coming out the opposite side. But if his opponent is only going to build Mantis, that will actually work. Now what I would have done here is built a radar behind the point defense and then started building a point defense. It would have worked out a little better for him, but he can do as he wishes. Medusa coming out is going to land a shot on that engineer. Engineer is toasty fried and now that point defense is going to die. Orange is happily sitting on his expansion. He does have a pretty good mass income right now. The only person further ahead of him is Darth Saruman. 
And that is because, well, actually, Saruman did not get his expansion. That is quite interesting. He went for early Tech 2 Mass Extractor upgrades, utilizing every single bit of mass that he possibly could off his island, except for these over here. I don't know if he realizes that there is more mass over here, because he did manually reclaim all of his other stuff. Got an engineer dropping down here, coordination from the northern team. Got one person clearing out the area with tanks, the other maintaining air control and then dropping an engineer. On the left side, Cod did pick up his expansion after bombing out that engineer. Hey, better late than never, and in this case, much better late than early. Something to remember next time somebody tries to get you out of bed. Not always does the early bird get the worm. There might be a bomber waiting for you when you roll out of bed. Got Navy going down for both players on the top left, and we've got a little bit of Navy back here. Just some denial subs, it looks like. Not really focusing on naval production. Got one naval factory here. Actually, both players building just to the south of the island. And then we do have both players building on the bottom left. So a lot of Navy going into the water. We've actually got extra naval factories going down out here. And it looks like Slevin and Saruman are going to be the top Ecos for the moment. Although uh, Slevin is uh, just barely stopped from killing that mass extractor and very wise pullback on that engineer. Pulling that engineer away from the main landmass so that the Tech 2 gunship could not kill it. And then that engineer is going to be able to come back and rebuild. Not having to transport a new engineer all the way across and cover all that distance and lose all of that time. Nice harassment from Dar Saruman, and that is going to put him solidly in the lead thanks to yet another Tech 2 mass extractor upgrade and killing off some of his opponent's mass extractors. No, ah, there's Tech 2 Navy. I was about to say no Tech 2 Navy, but I'm sitting here staring directly at it, so I better not say it. That is going to be a destroyer out first. Not a cruiser. Cruiser would have been an interesting choice, but really I think the destroyer will do just as well because the destroyer will have enough range to cover pretty much this entire island. Be able to bomb it out, no problemo. No other... Ah, uh, there's a T2 upgrade going down. And a T2 upgrade. One factory building engineers, not really the best thing. I would build a couple of land factories here to build engineers because the unload time on a naval factory is gargantuan. The actual engineer will build at the same pace, but unloading the engineer off the rail and starting production on another engineer takes a fairly significant amount of time compared to the other factories. Your roll off is very large. So that's something that you want to uh, uh, go around as much as you possibly can. Got these two artilleries doing work like bosses. They are coming around the outside edge, managed to kill off several things, and they are going to finally die at the hands of those auroras. That first destroyer is about to roll off. Might change the fate of that island. Got this expansion being shared between the two players. Share and share alike. Not often that you see teammates willing to give up some mass extractor positions like that. Got Slevin is just barely in the lead on mass income. He has recapped those mexes, and his teammate is not that bad off either at 57, only three behind. These guys are teching up quite hard, it looks like. They've got uh, Tech 2 power generators going down, and an assortment of other things. Not too much combat strength. Looks like they're just teching up at the moment. Got a stealth ship here. And, of course, there is the Salem, getting ready to go to war. Looks like we've got Salem versus Salem, but when you have a couple of frigates and a couple of subs accompanying, of course, you know who's going to win that. This destroyer, with the help of some artillery, is going to run over this island. No more expansion for COD. And... Not a whole lot else. We've got a Salem moving in here, but there's a Valiant class that is going to easily deal with those two frigates, provided that he can micro around a bit, which he is, forcing that Salem to miss quite a lot. And you can see how pitiful the 
Destroyer is versus the sub, taking quite a while to knock out that sub with its uh, torps. I can't remember. I think the 30 damage per second? I think it's 30 damage per second that the Valiant class has. You got a cruiser moving in from Orange. That is Elwood. UEF cruiser is actually substantially better than the Seraphim cruiser, especially when you have to overwhelm TMD. Although this being Aeon TMD, it is going to be a bit harder to spoof with a single cruiser. The UEF cruiser, if you'll notice its firing pattern, it fires a group of four and then it has a large gap. Each of those missiles has two HP. It takes two tack defense shots to knock down each one. So you can actually overwhelm a TMD with a single salvo of UEF fire. Seraphim has a continuous stream of TAC missiles, each with one health, and it takes a very, very long time for a Seraphim cruiser to overwhelm a TMD, and if you have a shield over the TMD, I believe it will actually never kill the TAC defense as long as you have vision out in front, so the TAC defense can start firing, and the shield uh, might need to get a little tiny bit lucky with the shield regen, but... It, it is very hard for a Seraphim cruiser to penetrate attack defense. That was a complete denial right here. These engineers are going to swoop in and grab that reclaim. It will be an assist to the bottom right hand team and that was not an assist that these guys needed to give up because they are in dire straits at the moment. They've got two cruisers. Actually there you can see side by side the firing patterns of the two cruisers. There is the Seraphim firing pattern and that is the UEF firing pattern. They're going to try to field some floaty tanks but it is a bit too little too late. These guys are generally leaving themselves alone. When you have conflict going on, you don't really want to instigate anything. You want to wait and see who's going to be the weakened party, who is going to possibly be eliminated. Kind of play it like a free-for-all. You do have multiple factions and you don't want to, uh, you don't want to provoke too many people at the same time because if everybody gangs up on you you're just gonna lose there's not really a whole lot you can do about that unless it's very very late game and you can pull off a snipe or something cruisers moving back in now that most of that hover has been dealt with still got those two destroyers and a handful of frigates so really no worries there and the artillery is gonna move around to the right to try to find an access point to get up onto the land Navy moving off to the right for some reason. Not really sure. Probably going after the expansion. Scouts out. Intel is always a good thing. We do have Tech 3 up for Zunin. That is going to let him grab a T3 generator, and I'm sure we'll see him start spamming either ASF or Strat Bombers momentarily. On the bottom side, looks like we're still on Tech 2. Not even starting a Tech 3 upgrade yet. No Tech 3 over here. Building drones. You do not really want to build kennels as UEF this early in the game. They are much less mass efficient than the engineers are. And I totally missed this. There are strat bombers coming in right here. Wailing away at Red, who is hiding underneath his Aeon shields, which have just gone down. Those Cybern strats giving him a bit of trouble. Mobile Shield running down trying to help out the ACU. We've got Sam's going up. Nope, those are Flak, my bad. Flak going up and a couple of ASF in the air trying to deal with those strats. We have to see how that holds up. The shields are back online. That ACU is safe. Where did those strat bombers come from? The T3 Air Factory, which I apparently looked at and thought was a Tech 2. My bad, people. You probably thought I was insane. My only excuse is I don't really have an excuse. I am inobservant this game, and I do apologize for that. Got a Soul Ripper going up. At least I didn't miss an ACU death, and hopefully that is not an omen. Knock on wood, I won't miss anything. <laughs> anything important, anyway. This is just kind of a for fun cast. I was not taking this seriously. Honestly, I wasn't going to do one today. It is already very late as I'm recording this, but I figured, you know, I really haven't been very good with it this week, so I'm going to go ahead and throw out one more game. Do justice to whoever sent me this cast. I honestly cannot remember which one of these guys it was. It was in my messages, and the name on the message was not the same as the name in the game. And uh, 
do you guys a favor because you guys are very good to me. Just to ramble for a minute while pretty much not much is happening. We got a little bit of activity right here, but not a whole lot going on at the moment. Oh, Tech 2 uh, bombers. Let's wait for the ramble until this goes past. I doubt this is going to get an ACU kill, but worse things have happened. It's going to shed about 3,000 health off that, or 2,000 health rather, off that ACU. An absolute horde of ASF ripping that group of fighter bombers to shreds, and Zunin is going to be perfectly safe. He is going to live to see another day. It amazes me, it really does, how dedicated the FAF community is. You, um, I, I was looking over YouTube statistics the other day, and as far as um, the loyalty of viewership per subscriber that I have, it is absolutely ludicrous compared to other YouTube channels. Because I don't know if you've noticed, most YouTube channels, they generally have a ton of subscribers and then they kind of plateau on their viewership because people will see certain videos that they like and they'll kind of go after those videos and not watch others. And anyway, and a classic example of this is uh, everybody references PewDiePie because PewDiePie is the biggest YouTube channel. Um, PewDiePie you know, has 35 million or whatever subscribers. But if you look, his videos usually average maybe 3 million views in the first week and they'll get up to maybe 5 so only maybe 15% or not fit no not 15% that would be 20% um, if it was 6,000 views 20% um, of people that are subscribed watch the videos whereas with this channel with people who watch Forged Alliance it is really crazy because there will be 1400 people that view it and the video will usually accumulate 1200 views over the course of a couple of weeks so pretty much 100% of the subscriber base <laughs> watches <laughs> at least some of the videos and it's pretty cool it's just it's just cool to see how you guys come together and support everything that goes on in FAF when the tournaments come out and all that other kind of stuff it's just it's just really cool to see it's a group of people that love this game that are dedicated to this game and always tune in to see what's going on so I, I really like to keep you guys uh, keep you guys fed and satisfied. I don't know exactly what to uh, call that. Brilliant dodging there by Cod, evading an entire run of Janus's. I feel bad when I don't release videos because then I don't know. I I, I just feel like I haven't fulfilled my duty to the community. Janus is coming in for another sweet cod moving out of the way. Janus is, despite having a ridiculously high area of effect, they do have a fairly slow projectile and suffer from the same dodgeability that affects most ooh, gunships trying to tear into that soul ripper but not really succeeding. And they are, ah oh no, they are focus fired on the ACU. And something I learned the other day, the Soul Ripper, ah, that is going to be an explosion. The Soul Ripper cannot actually focus its full damage potential on enemy gunships. It is not technically classified as a gunship. <laughs> oh, the Janus has actually got it. That is so sad. May have been a destroyer hit landed there. I can't believe that. That, that dodging went on for so long. Kudos to Cod for keeping his ACU alive that long, but with that low of health, it was really just inevitable at some point that the micro would mess up. That's going to leave his teammate very alone in this dangerous, dangerous world, and I think he is going to die shortly. It looks like Red is the powerhouse at the moment, and the top left team is not doing too shabbily. The Soul Ripper, I always thought it was classified as a gunship, and I thought that the gunships could fire at each other, which they can, but the Soul Ripper is in a class of its own. So even though you have a T4 air in your base, you cannot defend against a handful, and I do literally mean a handful, of gunships. And it's frustrating to see, and it, the Whalers have so much damage. They really do. You don't think that the damage stacks up that fast, but they are a very dangerous tool to have hammering away at you and uh, there's a dead ACU to show for it so that T4 is now going to be useless it is a wreck on the ground somewhere out here right there being reclaimed by Red Red sucking that mass up to put into a project he does have a Tempest coming in 
That is going to cause some major issues. And a Monkey Lord moving over towards the left-hand side is going to clear out this island. And actually, this is not good at all because the T3HQ is right here next to the island. And there's the defeat of the ACU as predicted. That shouldn't have really surprised anyone because, uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of Navy down there. It's going to kill the ACU eventually. Nothing really that can be done about that. And let's see here. Yellow, I really don't see coming out of this. Um, he is trying to get a battle cruiser out. He does not have really any other Navy. He's got a couple of Coopers and a single destroyer and a single cruiser, which is not going to give him any help. And his ACU is in the water here. That battle cruiser, I really don't care how well you micro. Oh, that's a battleship. My bad. I thought that was a battle cruiser. That battleship is not going to be able to kill all of this navy before it dies. I'm sorry, it's just not going to happen. It is not fast enough, it cannot dodge well enough, the destroyers are too powerful, and the Tempest is going to give it a run for its money. Orange claiming it has a 20% nuke. There is the nuke launcher. Is there a nuke defense? That is the question. Yes, there is, and it is very nearly loaded. So that is going to not really be a worry for this team. And there's a nuke defense there that is not loaded at all. Elwood, mass stalling as well. So that nuke is not going to load very quickly. And even though the summit is a mighty and fearsome warrior, we are about to see it fall. And the cruiser is just shredding these drones. So sad to see. And all your build power going poof. Although at this point, even if you had land-based engineers, I think they would be going poof as well. Underway to fire from all of those destroyers. ACU is going to run out towards the left. What on earth? Someone quit. Ah, there was a disconnect. Somebody had to quit in order for the game to progress. That turned out to be Zunin. So this is actually looking fairly even. Red has a tremendous amount of map control, a buttload of reclaim, and a huge attack force. We've got two players alive over here, and yellow is about to die. So we're going to have red versus blue and orange. Tempest moving in down here. If I were him, I would be pushing the summit towards the other side, and I would walk my ACU down into a random corner somewhere and hope that all the other players killed each other and forgot that I existed because that's pretty much the only hope that Kiro has. Maybe there will be total mutual nuclear annihilation, maybe not. One thing that is going for orange and blue is that the nuke defense is now dead. That nuke defense that was blocking the path to success for that nuke launcher over there. There is still a nuke defense right down here but it is only about 30 to 35 percent loaded whereas the nuke is almost done so red must be actually be in a pretty massive stall yes he is holy cow so much power stall probably due to reclaim whereas i'm guessing that elwood did take care of his stalled situation yes he is balancing his eco quite nicely you gonna see that summit finally go down i think and that ACU continuing to walk across the landmass and kind of fade into the corner over there. Although there are T3 subs around, I don't think that ACU is going to last long. I am curious to see if this donut will get built. We are about to see a nuke launch. Where it will go, I think we can all guess. It is probably going to be aimed directly for red as a last ditch effort. Pardon me, still not completely over all of that sinus crap. I don't know why the flu season has been so bad this year. I think everyone, and I do literally mean everyone at my work, had the flu um, at some point or another, and it's just sticking around with us. My uh, one of my bosses had was sick for almost nine weeks with uh, between had the flu which turned into a sinus infection, which turned into bronchitis, which turned into something else. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's been a miserable winter, I can tell you that. Well, winter honestly has just started, but whatever. 
You know what I mean. Um, yeah, we're about to see another nuke. There is no way that Kiro is getting out of this one. His ASU was his last unit alive, and it is going to go down in a blaze of glory. Red Navy moving over to the left. There is no way that Blue has enough to stop that, so he is going to move around. And there's the nuke coming around to the right-hand base. And the ASU is fleeing in terror from the incoming apocalypse. I think that this is going to have a decisive effect on the outcome of this game. Oh, it did not damage the Tsar. The Caesar is still up and it can be completed. Slevin still has 179 income with a little bit in storage. If he stops his other production, he has enough Navy to survive for a while. Well, 500 income now, thanks to a handy dandy thing known as Reclaim. He's gonna go ahead and get everything back together that he can. I think despite having his main base nuked, he is going to finish that Caesar and he is going to be just fine. It's always impressive when you can survive a direct nuke to the heart of your base and still have enough to wreck the rest of the map. That means you're doing something right. We got two Tempests now moving up towards the base. It is going to be quite dangerous once it hits home. T3 subs in production, but sadly there are only a couple on the field. I think three total, and there that is not going to be enough to be decisive. Actually, looking at how much torque damage potential there is in all these destroyers and tempests, I think three T3 subs would have a hard time killing anything, period. So let me revise that statement. That Caesar is going up in a pretty big hurry. They're still positive mass, my goodness. Pulling 224 and reclaiming to make up the difference with some extremely heavy assistance. Well, I don't know. No, it's not. My bad. He has actually gone to naval production for some reason. I was used to seeing that huge curve of engineers over there, but it has been placed into uh, service somewhere else. Namely, the naval factories. I would be finishing that. The donut is a fun toy to play with. You're going to wreck so much stuff with it. it just, it's a shame not to use it. You need to, you need to do that. And what is this? This is an ACU drop. This is a commander shield, or a bubble shield rather. No, that is a personal shield. My bad. Personal shield ace you with the T3 building suite. That is interesting. He dropped right next to a galactic colossus. That is, it depends on whether or not Red sees him. He does have a stealth gen down. It does not appear that anything is moving in that direction. And there is a whole host of Janus swarming up in the northern side maybe that will be the determining factor against this gc throwing down tech three point defense and that is actually in range of the galactic losses that is funny i'm gonna start wailing away on that thing and it is just going to stand there and take it navy moving up towards the north those tempests bringing their cannons to bear on this base that is a terrifying proposition. We've got Nawasa under production over here. And the Tsar is on the move. Caesar obliterating the face off of those Janus. And then it is going to run after this ACU. That is the bubble shield. What do you know? That ACU is going to come back and go for an overcharge on the Galactic Colossus. But he needs to run. The Caesar is going to start hammering down on the top of that shield. Pick the long way to the water. There's no way he's going to make it. And there goes Orange meeting his fate at the center of a fireball. And this Awasa is about to come online. But I don't think there is any point to it. I think that this is going to be game. Unless he lands the world's luckiest Control K bomber. Technically, I think... If the bomber landed a bomb here and crashed onto the... No, it still wouldn't because you'd have to land a second bomb to break the T3 shield and damage what is underneath it. There is no way to kill that ACU in one pass at the Awasa. And there's more than enough ASF to kill off that Awasa before it gets a second turn. But there are ASF here. 
You're going to see an air engagement. And it's going to be a horrible loss for Blue, I think. But he is going to be the instigator. Maybe not. There is an awful lot of uh, spreading out of the ASF going on here. And that is allowing a smaller swarm of blue ASF to actually collectively kick the tail of a larger group since uh, all of the damage is concentrated. Owasa running around to the south. We may actually have a game here. ACU transporting to the left and southward. We're going to see this play out. That is a edge glitch there actually and you can see that is not something that you want to do your transport will actually lose its order asf moving do they see the transport they don't looping back around that was probably a scout trying to find the acu the caesar is going to move in asf are on the wrong side of the map awasa coming in for a bomb it is going to hit and shield is going to stay up asf going to move over to the right Actually, the, <laughs> oh, the Caesar is coming too. A uh, bomber coming down again. That is one solid hit. One more bomb. Is he going to get it? Oh, yes. Ground fire. A player who knows how to ground fire. That's what we all love. The final bomb. ASU goes up and it is a turnaround. Very brilliantly executed Super Zero. Down to the last group of units. A comeback virtually from the grave. I thought for sure that Red had that game tied up in a clean knot and carrying it off to his home as a trophy. But here comes Super Zero. So kudos to him. Brilliant play. I love it. I love games like that. Well done, my good sir. Alrighty, guys. That is going to wrap it up for me for this week and this cast and this game. I'm going to tune in back with you guys on, I think, Tuesday. Well, late Tuesday night is when it will be posted. So it might be Wednesday morning for some of you guys when the cast comes out. But I will be back online with my normal casting schedule at the beginning of next week. And I will see you guys then. Thanks so much for watching.